Thank you for inviting me. I'm assuming that many of the attendees today have, if not experience in media psychology, certainly an interest and in, in curiosity in the subject. I'm also here to formally announce that Fielding has started and will begin a certificate in media psychology with a concentration in media neuroscience. And for those of you who are interested in that certificate, you can visit medianeurosciencecertificate.com. The purpose of this talk is to give you a sense of what this field of neuromarketing is, why has it emerged, and more importantly, what is the value and potentially the limits or the concerns that some of you may have about the emergence of this particular field. The media landscape has evidently completely changed and rapidly so in the last 10 years especially. A lot of those messages arrive to your brain as this gush of water. A lot of those messages have no other option but to bounce off the brain. My interest and passion has been to really understand what is the quality of messages that somehow find their way inside the brain and of course this metaphor is really to avoid talking too technically about constructs that I will discuss today, such as attention, emotion, engagement, memory. There's many constructs that in neuromarketing we try to address in ways that are very different because we do place the brain at the center of the equation. Now, as a researcher, I started over 30 years ago. I was stuck in traditional methods of research that really depended upon upon my ability to have conversations with customers and potentially observe their behavior, which is never terribly efficient. But I felt for many years of my career as a researcher, as a marketing researcher, that I was always dependent upon people's ability to articulate really what they feel about a particular choice or piece of advertising. And more importantly, could I really entirely trust what people tell me? In research, we call that self-report validity. It's very clear as we begin to have a much better understanding of behavior and particularly through the field of neuroscience that a lot of our own consumer choices or media choices are not necessarily conscious and as such cannot be reported. So about 15 years ago I decided to really orient my research away from traditional methods into method that were coming primarily from the field of neuroscience. The field of neuroscience is a rather intimidating field altogether. It can be encompassing work that has clearly clinical benefits as well as sciences such as the study of economic behavior or leadership or even parenting. Uh, but it's an enormous body of knowledge uh, that has contributed a much better understanding of many of those responses that we study in media psychology really are dependent upon good theoretical models that are informed by good research. Just to give you an idea on the contribution of neuroscience specifically, we estimate that 90% of the knowledge we currently have on the brain has been produced in the last decade. Of course, in just a few minutes, I'm not going to summarize everything you need to know about the brain, but the field of media neuroscience or consumer neuroscience or neuromarketing and all those terms are somewhat synonym is really first and foremost looking at how the brain really works, particularly when we are consuming media or making choices. Now we do know, and these are very simple aspects of brain functioning that I wanted to introduce, we do know that while there are areas that are localized in the brain, such as language for instance, many of the functions, whether they are specific to attention or memory or even emotional response, typically involve multiple brain areas, which means really involve networks. And fortunately, in today's technology, we have the ability to not necessarily look for a button in the brain, but potentially a network that would be involved. We also know that a tremendous amount of functions work below our level of consciousness. What does that mean? Again, it means that it just happens below our ability to report and explain and understand a lot of what's going on. We also have convincing models now 
suggesting that in a way we don't have two brain, we have two systems in the brain. And the book of Daniel Kahneman particularly established this idea in a very convincing way by suggesting that those two systems conflict and in a way create this sort of dynamic tension that is so much at play during consumer choices or even media consumption. System one is known to be more dated because connecting to the vertebra is the part of the brain that regulates heartbeat, breathing, digestion, very much triggers decisions and choices below our level of consciousness, whereas system two, as the number would suggest, came after and did give much more ability for us as consumers or humans to reflect, to think, to calculate, to integrate a lot of the sensory information that we're able to capture. Just to give you an idea, and this is really important when you're starting to look at media effectiveness or consumer research, these are parameters that give you a sense of the really distinctive nature of both systems. Understanding that, and this was counter to many persuasion models, that we're finding that the system one activation has a tremendous role in determining the direction and potentially closing or triggering decisions far more often than we suspect. Most models today, particularly as it pertains to media, neuroscience, or neuromarketing, are looking at specific constructs, and this is terrible slides from the perspective of having to read a lot of information, but it has at least the value of clarifying some of the constructs that I have been using mostly in my commercial aspect of dealing with neuromarketing. As you can see, there are a number of functions we are especially interested in and for which we can measure using different methods the neural correlate. For instance, I'll take a very simple one, particularly through the measurement of the autonomic nervous system. We can pretty much measure the degree to which people are focusing the valuable and necessary energy that they need to engage with this piece of advertising. Certainly the visual processing data is crucial for determining the degree to which people are processing the data, at what speed they are processing it, and whether that visual processing will correlate to engagement, emotion, and the potential that people want to approach a situation instead of withdrawing from it. I don't want to be too technical in the little time that we have, but as you can see, there is clearly a number of constructs, not necessarily new from the perspective that the study of attention and emotion has been done for decades, but we do study these constructs in specifically the context of brain activity. We do look specifically at the role of the amygdala in the presence of threats or in vigilant states because we know that the amygdala is somewhat considered the boss of system one and the activation of the amygdala could indicate dominance or priority established by system one over system two. Emotions, for instance, and I'm picking only a few of those constructs that are largely discussed now in neuromarketing papers. Emotions are biologically chemicals that trigger specific states, and this is a very well-known wheel of primal emotions. I'm sure when you look at this, you all recognize emotions that you may even experience in one day. But what's interesting about what we understand now about the neurobiological basis of emotions is very specific neurotransmitters or hormones will typically correlate to those particular emotions. So trust will correlate to oxytocin, for instance. Laughter, joy would correlate with endorphins. Anticipation would correlate with dopamine. We as neuromarketers have this ability of tracing and tracking the presence of these chemicals and then making deduction or measurements or calculations as to the presence of a particular emotion. And all of that without really necessarily talking to anybody. And I want to be a little more concrete on the tool bag of methods a typical neuromarketer would use. The seven listed, we would call them neuromarketing modalities. Some of you would probably recognize methods that have been around for a while. They are now sort of considered part of the tool bag of neuromarketing practitioners. Endocrine studies are not the easiest to conduct. I've had the pleasure of doing a lot of work, both academically and commercially, with Dr. Paul Zak out of Claremont Graduate University. And Paul and I developed this particular experiment to identify whether a group of people under elevated levels of oxytocin would behave differently when asked to donate or participate in the fundraising campaign. And what we did is indeed establish there was a significant 
significant difference indicating there is a correlation between elevated levels of oxytocin and donation and generosity. This was actually a published paper. As neuromarketers are uh, attempting to publish, it takes quite a while for these papers to show up. So any of you who would really take their interest in neuromarketing seriously, you will find that there are more and more papers being published and really addressing those kinds of questions. Can elevated level of a particular neurotransmitter be correlated with the influence of public service announcements? And those papers are, again, clearly helpful and important for fields such as neuromarketing to establish its validity and its scientific credentials. Now, you may wonder, how good is it for any study to reveal that oxytocin will potentially influence or increase donation to public service announcement? There are plenty of studies available on how we naturally produce more oxytocin. For instance, hugging people will produce more oxytocin. Getting a massage will produce more oxytocin. Empathy and trust are states known to elevate oxytocin. In fact, trust specifically, and I encourage everybody to go and watch the TED talk of Dr. Zach, in which he is talking extensively about the biological basis of trust as it relates to elevated levels of oxytocin. I'll move to another protocol which is rarely used by neuromarketers. The reason is it's not that easy to sample voice, and that is to record a conversation and then use software to identify the presence of very specific emotions. In my business called SalesBrain, we do that quite a bit because it's an important way of verifying if people really feel what they say. And so we sample typically the voice every five seconds and we can identify emotions like hesitation, embarrassment, shame, stress, happiness, excitement. So it's quite a powerful tool to use to extract emotional and neurophysiological data from a conversation. The field of facial expression study has grown a lot. Of course, the show Lie to Me popularized the science and gave a pretty good portrait of what can be done with it. Even five years ago, the field was really a field of gurus that were known to be able to detect the meaning of drooping upper eyelids. That field is now, in fact, become a technology field. And I know that the chapter is called the Media Psychology and Technology. Technology is truly making possible the emergence of neuromarketing. There's no way the field would have any future or credibility without technology. And in this particular case, what we have now are software that can use the code originally identified by Dr. Paul Ekman, who identified the universality of seven facial expressions and has clearly documented those codes based on facial movements of about 40 plus facial muscles. The software that we're able to use today can track and reveal real time the presence of sadness or happiness or fear. And those kinds of studies can in fact be completely done over the internet. So we have the ability without bringing people into a lab to show them pieces of media and record and calculate the presence of all those emotions. Neurophysiological testing is a way of primarily collecting data that comes from the autonomic nervous system. You're seeing in this particular slide the type of sensors we use for monitoring sweat, which is really a pretty effective way to measure the state in which people may be. We typically call arousal when they are experiencing an ad. We measure that about 10 times per second, and that gives us a really good idea of what people are feeling, particularly as they watch, let's say, a commercial. We've done some really interesting work in this particular case, again, with a partnership of Paul Zach and his business called O-Factor. We measured really second by second the emotional and the attention and the engagement that people feel when they're watching a commercial from the Humane Society of the United States. And for these kinds of organizations, really understanding the peaks of valleys of an ad is crucial. It potentially helps them re-edit and optimize the way this ad is working. It really helps sharpen the emotional intensity or the narrative arc of a particular story. In our ability to measure, we all obviously want to go to recommendations that will improve the piece of media without destroying the quality of the narrative uh, structure. We use software today that gives us some predictions of where the eyes will go. For that, the software is really building upon the field of computational neuroscience, very, very fast 
fast growing field which is really feeding us with models, algorithms that can take data coming from the brain into reliable predictions, particularly for instance from the visual system. Think of how computational neuroscientists are basically able to predict based on what's called the image saliency, which is a big or intimidating word to basically suggest the degree to which the image has the capacity to attract and activate specific neurons in the brain. And of course, those neurons would be neurons committed to processing color, contour, borders, texture. And before you know it, you have models that can predict nearly 70 to 75 percent of what would be obtained by doing true eye tracking. True eye tracking, again, has been around for a while. We do that now even online, and that is with permission. We're able to track using the camera of a desktop, or we're able to track specifically where people's eyes are going and for how long. And we can study the gaze path, which is really an important aspect to determine which objects on a particular website have the capacity to attract first and foremost, and what is potentially the course our eyes or our gaze will take based on the way certain objects are laid out on a page. EEG is a very popular method today in the field of media neuroscience and neuromarketing. We use EEGs that have not necessarily clinical grade, but between nine or sometimes 24 electrodes that help us really capture information that comes from the surface of the brain, otherwise known as the cortical surface. We, unlike the neurophysiological study where I said we were sampling you know, 10 times per second, we can sample actually up to a thousand times per second. And it's very clear at that speed that we're tapping into signals that are impossible for anybody to report. We typically extract from this data, which is a lot of data, three predictions of psychological attitudes against the stimulus. Attention, the degree to which people are in fact committing energy. Approach is really calculations based on emotions that are pushing us to engage. They're called approach emotions or the opposite, which would be withdrawal or avoidance. And we can have some pretty good index of that based on EEG data. And an important aspect of what we measure, which I think has been very well addressed and revealed by media neuroscience or neuromarketing, is the importance of cognitive load or cognitive effort. We do not enjoy, as humans, high cognitive load, and we don't really typically engage a lot of areas in our brain to interact with media because it's costly, it potentially can be exhausting, and because we still allow system one to calculate and engage at levels that are much more energy efficient. And this is an important aspect of part of the consulting that comes with media neuroscience is really teach web designers, people who produce commercials or any form of media content to really pay attention to the importance of limiting cognitive load. I'll discuss in closing a couple more points. One, a method that is not typically used commercially but is revealing of a lot of very interesting activity in the brain. Functional MRI are giving us far more than the EEG is giving us, not necessarily in terms of the quantity of the information, but certainly in terms of the location or depth of the information. In this particular case, what functional MRI can do is reveal blood distribution, which is another way of locating and measuring how much glucose and oxygen is consumed by specific areas in the brain. Those types of neuroimages really help us understand networks. It helps us understand potentially to which extent system one is engaged, which is very difficult to measure with just an EEG, given that EEG would measure typically system two activity. So as you can see, there are very powerful tools that are being used to probe and understand and predict media effect or advertising effect. Now we come here at the juncture of this workshop to address the problem of ethics. Clearly the popularization of neuromarketing, which is now anchored and I think solidly confirmed as a field, the potential for the misuse of neuromarketing research is clear. And when I actually initiated the field, so to speak, I decided to make it a priority for our association called the Neuromarketing Science and Business Association to write a code of ethics. So if you go to 
our site, salesbrain.com, you will find that code of ethics. In the code, really what we want to do is address as seriously as we can three issues that may arise. Obviously, you want to make sure that you don't harm subjects and some of those methods, particularly using functional MRI, are not free of issues. It could stress people, it could potentially change their states, which of course would compromise the data to begin with. Data integrity is a critical aspect. Maintaining anonymity, not really seeking to reveal data that is not part of the subject. So all of those issues are clearly important to document and conform with. And finally, of course, the potential that neuromarketing studies could reveal potentially a more effective techniques to sell to vulnerable targets. Obviously, at the fielding specifically, there's a lot of interest and a lot of commitment towards advocacy and protection of vulnerable subjects. And that can be and should be a cause for a major attention, particularly as neuromarketing will grow. In a way, though, neuromarketing has the potential for revealing the degree to which some campaigns are potentially manipulative or abusive. And I do encourage, and I do myself, volunteer quite a bit for organization. In my particular case, locating here in Hawaii, I volunteer for the American Red Cross, and I help them really use the science of neuromarketing to improve their campaigns, which in that case is really potentially trying to save lives and improve the world as we know. I, I do think there are sort of a good and bad of neuromarketing, but as long as neuromarketers and media psychologists, to the extent that they perform neuromarketing, studies are mindful and respectful of these ethical principles, I think we're in good shape. I hope this was informative enough to give you a sense of what neuromarketing really is, what is the promise, what are potentially some of the risks, and if you have additional questions, you certainly can visit, again, the medianeurosciencecertificate.com site or the salesbrain.com site. Thank you. I do have a question. This is Rafa. Christoph, thank you for this presentation. Actually, answer a lot of the questions perhaps that I already put on the chat room. I'm still actually compelled to ask, after the certificate in media neuroscience, will we be able to employ our skills and knowledge learned, perhaps using eye tracking and perhaps acquiring and procuring those uh, technologies and apply the skills and knowledge that one may learn in the certificate of media neuroscience? That's a great question. Let me manage expectations without diluting, I think, the value value of the certificate, you will have a really good understanding of the value of collecting information from the brain to complement or potentially substitute the value of traditional market research. And I think that is critical to the use or value of neuromarketing overall. A lot of people have claimed in the industry that they have the ability to do neuromarketing studies and they don't even have a solid understanding of how the brain works. So that's number one. I'm clearly not suggesting that I'm going to turn people into neuroscientists in three courses, but there will be enough of the fundamental aspects of what to know to be credible and solid conversing about neuromarketing value. Number two, there are technology options today that are available without requiring additional technical knowledge. Part of the certificate is to really make people aware of these technology platforms, whether it's it is the possibility of conducting facial imaging over the internet, whether it's the possibility of even sampling voice using software, which is commercially available, whether it's even the possibility of doing eye tracking, which is in fact quite easy to do. And I think you remember, Rafa, that uh, I was doing a workshop for fielding with a very small eye tracker that costs $99 and is quite easy to use. There are other methods that really do require more technical training that the certificate will not get into the manipulation of biosensors for tracking skin conductivity, heart rates, the type of data that is produced by those sensors is a bit technical. It's not out of reach. In subsequent training, you can probably find outside the fielding, but you would understand the fundamentals of what these biosensors do and what sort of constructs you can get out of those biosensors. So you could pick and select a vendor that could hopefully do a good job producing that data for you. The same is true of EEG and the same is true, of course, of fMRI. So yes, on one end, there are possibilities of being up and running and doing certainly neuromarketing with platforms that exist as software as a service.
service, and that's through facial imaging, eye tracking, to some extent voice. These other methods will require either for you to take additional technical training programs or hire or identify a partner. And typically in universities, people may have even the equipment to perform many of those methods. First, thanks, Doctor, for this awesome visual presentation and accommodating your schedule and everything. I just wanted to ask a question about the self-report validity that you were talking about and relating that to visual processing and advertising. I think it was just remarkable how we can kind of get beyond the bias or intention to lie that some people have to say that they feel a certain way or that they identify a certain way. And you're able to, with neuroscience, combat that with the actual science of truth and using the brain as kind of like this lie detector test and this well of knowledge like by looking at the things like the releases of oxytocin and things like that. With my area of focus, I'm really looking at, interested in anyway, in the advertising and how do you position that to engage with audiences and how brands will look at that as a tool to interact with audiences better. Yeah, so of course that's a big expectation that neuromarketers have and that is to reveal the truth of how we feel. The brain is so complicated that we can only make some predictions that the presence of activity in a certain area of the brain may reveal the intention of engaging rather than withdrawing. So I think we got to be careful in some of those claims. But what I think it does is potentially identify incoherence, incongruence between what people say and what they do. In advertising specifically, people articulate that they like an ad, but they don't actually behave according to that state. We're able, I think, with neuromarketing studies to cut out a lot of that guesswork that customers do when they are asked. And when you start looking at the biological response that we have in front of a story or a piece of media, as I suggested right here, it is very erratic. It's a bunch of peaks and valleys that corresponds to frame changes, specific pictures that may appear or changes in the narrative structure, these changes are happening at a speed that simply doesn't allow us to comment or respond to. And so it gives us really an idea of overall, what are the ads, for instance, that seem to perform well based on the narrative structure, based on what we call the emotional lift, which is typically the distance between a low point emotionally and a high point emotionally. And, and a lot of these studies, by the way, Tunisha, and I'm sure you're well versed in this, confirming what many people have hypothesized about what makes a great movie and so on. So I'm not suggesting that neuromarketing is necessarily conflicting with what we know theoretically. I just think it's making this a little more scientific and less dependent upon people's ability to participate. That's a very good point because it's important, I think, to note that because the brain is so massive, I mean, and the speed that we're talking about of our eyes and the releasing of all of these things, we're allowed to feel kind of conflicting things, you know, when we're talking about Kahneman and System 1 and System 2, I mean, we're still human at the end of the day, and some of us are Geminis, so we have kind of these dual personalities where we can feel a certain way or feel affiliated to something but act in a different way. So it's interesting that where neuromarketing can come in handy, where marketers would feel more inclined to put more money towards a certain way. You know what I mean? It's like, well, the science says that there's this. So neuromarketing can become useful in terms of which direction an ad can go. Do we go more aggressive or do we go more safe? Do you see a lot with what you're doing with the Red Cross and any other campaigns that you've been working with? Do you see the money side of it being a big factor or a big component into what direction an ad particularly takes? It's typically the motivating factor. A lot of advertising dollars are completely wasted. A lot of advertising agencies really do not operate with any kind of theory to speak of. When I did my dissertation, I was focusing specifically on public health messages that are supposed to get our kids out of trouble for not drinking and driving or to not text and drive. I mean, these are really important messages and less than a third of those campaigns have any kind of identifiable persuasion theory, which I'm not necessarily bashing advertising agencies, but I'm only suggesting that there's a lot of guesswork, there's a lot of approximations in the design and construction of those messages, and yet lives are at stake. 
So I think now is the time to make the field of media psychology and the contribution of fielding and other organizations to really educate students or even professionals to the existence of these uh, persuasion models and to hopefully help them both save money, which is the sort of commercial aspect of neuromarketing, and potentially save lives. And I think the promise is, is really exciting and certainly my passion for the field is, is fueled by those two. I clearly need to pay the rent somehow, right? But I'm excited at the possibility that neuromarketing can become a vibrant field of study. And, and so from a student perspective, we get so much inquiries about the field. And that's why the initiative of fielding is really timely. And I think uh, responding to a need, Rafa in, in his role in the army recognizes also the importance of understanding of propaganda or understanding messages that are being used to influence and potentially destructively. So a lot of vulnerable minds. So there's an interest in so many levels for having more science support media effect and media from the perspective of persuasive media. Much agreed. Thank you. Hey, Christoph, this is Linda Durnell. And along the lines of what you're saying, this certification, is it something that can actually be a stepping stone to a career path? And as such, are they designing neuromarketing departments? Are you seeing nonprofits embracing it, like you're saying? I know advertising probably, but is this a new career opportunity, especially understanding how expensive the tech is, like the fMRI? What are you seeing out there, especially since you've been out there so much with sales brain and all? Great question. Obviously, I do see, particularly in the last two years, companies that are requesting additional skills that pertain to psychology and neuroscience, specifically as it applies to marketing. I, in fact, ironically have a former student of mine who is being considered for a job for a very, very large and very successful company in Silicon Valley. And she has that particular field of neuromarketing and media psychology as a plus on her curriculum, on her resume. Big companies were initially, as you would suspect, quite reluctant. Uh, there was a lot of observation initially. Now they're going full blast, which means they're not necessarily buying a functional MRI, by the way, but they don't typically see that they need to buy a lab, but they certainly feel that either they need to have people in-house that understand the topic so that they can identify and properly interact with vendors, which is and potentially can be intimidating. And back to Rafa's question, on the value of the certificate, I do believe one of the best value of the certificate is to make people who have the certificate competent and credible neuromarketing managers, if you will, when it comes to selecting vendors, setting up the specifics of a neuromarketing study to make sure that it's not overextending on the objectives of the study and really applying good science to measure the constructs that we discussed today. Great. Thank you. And I think this pairs really well with the branding certificate and audience engagement that you and Dr. Rutledge are going to be having too. So the, the certificates of neuromarketing and then the branding, actual advertising, audience engagement side of things, I think is an awesome pairing and super excited to see where, where all of this goes. Yeah, I should say both certificates in media psychology because the branding certificate by Jerry and Pam is also very, very exciting. I do think that those programs are legitimate degrees that will complement and, and create differentiation, which for candidate is as crucial as it is for media. In other words, if your field of study is splashing on the recruiter's brains, you're not going to have the right job, the right career advancement. So I do think that the edge created by these program is, is crucial potentially for anybody's career. So thank you for inviting me. We really appreciate you sharing with us today and making time in your schedule to do so. And I thank very you welcome. myself as well as for the Society for Media Psychology and Technology because this is just an, an honor to have you in our research webinar series. Thank you everyone and thank you Christoph. We really appreciate it.